In this video, we're going to consider the structure and stability of benzene. And I wanted to start with just a little bit of history concerning the structure of benzene. It was actually hotly debated earlier, early in the history of organic chemistry. This is long before spectroscopic methods, long before people understood resonance, and really electronic structure, and even before the discovery of the electron itself. So a lot was uncertain, and this led to a lot of interesting hypotheses about the structure of benzene. It was known very early that the molecular formula of the compound was C6H6, and that it wasn't a typical unsaturated organic compound. It was not a typical alkene, because it didn't engage in addition reactions, for example, with Br2 or, or other halogens. And so the proposals you can see here, the structural pro proposals, some of them look absolutely wild to a modern eye. You know, for example, this proposal of Klaus with bonds bridging across the six-membered ring looks, looks absolutely crazy. Um, some of them don't have six equivalent positions, which from spectroscopy we can verify must be the case. So Dewar benzene, for example, looks like a compound with... Um, two different types of hydrogens in it, which is not consistent with the spectroscopic evidence. Similarly, uh, with the Huckel situation, those six carbons don't look equivalent. The one who came closest was Auguste Kekulé, who proposed a structure for benzene that is very familiar to us today, with alternating double and single bonds within the ring, hallmark of conjugation, right, and one hydrogen linked to each carbon in a six-membered ring structure. But Kekulé didn't get it exactly right. He felt that, he, he first of all understood you could draw this structure in two different ways with the double and single bonds alternating in two different ways. He believed that these two different ways of drawing the benzene molecule corresponded to what we would now call constitutional isomers and that those constitutional isomers were rapidly interconverting. And to show what this looks like, we could imagine just shifting the double bonds around through resonance electron flow like this, what we would now call resonance electron flow like this, right? Kegelay believed that this was actually an equilibrium, that there was actual chemical change going on as these bonds shifted around. We now know that this is not the case, that these two ways of drawing benzene are resonance forms, and the true structure of benzene is a hybrid of these two resonance forms, which we see at the bottom of the slide here. The true structure has those six pi electrons delocalized over all six carbons, and the true structure is a hybrid, a 50-50 hybrid, of these two ways of drawing the benzene um, Lewis structure. Kekulé sort of ended up winning the day, but was a little bit off in the way he thought about this. Okay, as we mentioned, benzene and other aromatic compounds don't undergo typical reactions of alkenes, most notably the additions of electrophiles such as halogens. So when you hit a, a plain vanilla alkene with Br2, it undergoes halogenation. We get anti-addition of the two halogen atoms to the two atoms of the alkene plus the enantiomer of this compound. When you try that same reaction with benzene, absolutely nothing happens. You mix in bromine, which is a liquid, with benzene, which is also a liquid. No reaction occurs, and we get a persistent brown, orange, yellow color of a solution of bromine and benzene, essentially. One of the reasons for this is because benzene is quite stable, and to get a sense of that stability, we can return to heats of hydrogenation, which we looked at for acyclic conjugated systems. So the idea here is we're going to look at how much energy is released when a compound containing carbon-carbon double bonds is hydrogenated. H2 is, is added to the carbons of the alkene or diene or triene to create an alkane. And the four experiments here all end with the product of cyclohexane. We start with cyclohexene, for example, one mole of that, let's say, and add one mole of H2, negative 28.7 kilocalories of enthalpy is released, or the enthalpy change is negative 28.7 kilocalories. When we move to cyclohexadiene, which is a conjugated cyclic diene, and add two moles of H2 to one mole of that, well, we get back to cyclohexane, and now this is negative 55.5 kilocalories is the enthalpy change. With three double bonds, now this is entirely hypothetical, right? Because we don't want to get to benzene. We want to think about a molecule with three double bonds kind of in isolation right, so that we don't turn on the aromatic stabilization of benzene, essentially. To do that, we sort of extrapolate from these two results, and that extrapolation would lead to a 
hydrogenation enthalpy change of negative 86 kilocalories for this hypothetical 135 cyclohexatriene, we might say. This is an extrapolation from these first two results. What we actually observe when hydrogenating benzene is that the enthalpy change is much, much less negative than negative 86. It's negative 49.7 kilocalories. And the difference between this extrapolated enthalpy and the actual observed enthalpy is a measure of the stabilization of benzene as a result of its conjugation and really aromaticity, right? This is not just conjugation. There's something more going on here. We can get a sense of that if we think back to the fact that for 1,3-butadiene, the stabilization due to conjugation was only about 3.6 kilocalories per mole. This 36.3, which is the difference between negative 86 and negative 49.7, it's on a whole nother level, on a whole nother planet, in a whole nother galaxy in terms of stabilization energy. So rather than just quote unquote calling this conjugation, which it is, we call it aromaticity because it is a very special type of conjugation that leads to massive stabilization relative to comparable acyclic molecules like 1,3-butadiene and even 1,3,5-hexatriene. The pi molecular orbitals of benzene look very different from those of an acyclic conjugated polyene like hexatriene. And here I want to highlight this, looking both at the shapes and the orbital energies. Those orbital energies are going to help us explain why benzene is so darn stable. So here in Hewlett, I have 135-hexatriene, the acyclic conjugated polyene with the same number of carbons as benzene. Now if we focus on the HOMO and LUMO here, that HOMO-LUMO gap is roughly about one unit on this scale, right? About plus 0.5 here and negative 0.5 here for those orbital energies. If I now build the structure of benzene, six carbons, cyclic array like so, optimize it, and I look at the orbital energies, the picture is very different now. Now, the energy of the HOMO is quite a bit lower and the LUMO is quite a bit higher, so the HOMO-LUMO gap has increased and the energies of the pi electrons have gone down, and now there's degeneracy in the orbitals. I've got two orbitals at the same energy here, and two orbitals at the same energy here. These orbitals that are equal in energy are said to be degenerate. So the molecular orbitals of benzene are quite a bit different from those of an acyclic polyene like hexatriene. And on this slide here, you can see pictures of the shapes of all of these orbitals. We can notice some things that are similar to pi molecular orbitals we've seen previously. For instance, as we go up in energy, the number of nodes increases. No nodes at all in this lowest energy filled pi bonding orbital. But when we get up here to the first set of degenerate orbitals, we notice one node. In this left-hand orbital, it's right here. There's a nodal plane that cuts right through the middle of the molecule right there. And in the other orbital here, there is a nodal plane that cuts through those two carbons, like so. So one nodal plane in each of those orbitals. And as we go up to the next set of degenerate orbitals, we see now two nodal planes. In this orbital, there's a nodal plane there and a node there. And in this orbital, we have a nodal plane right here and one right here. So two nodal planes in these orbitals. And naturally, when we go up to the highest pi molecular orbital, the highest pi antibonding orbital, there are three nodal planes. There's one right there, there's one here, and there's one here. So in that respect, these orbitals are analogous to other types of pi molecular orbitals we've seen. They're also, of course, constructed of two p atomic orbitals on each atom, overlapping in either a constructive or destructive way, all that kind of good stuff. Um, benzene is unique in that there are two homos, right, two degenerate orbitals that are the highest occupied orbitals, and two lumos, two degenerate orbitals that are the lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals. So we still tend to pay attention to those. In benzene itself, these are degenerate. This is not going to be the case in substituted benzenes and aromatic heterocycles generally.